Good morning. It's Wednesday. It's going to be a busy day today, so I thought I would uh, record on my way in today. I've already gotten great news that our electronic medical record is not working, so it's going to just put an icing on the cake, I guess. But think about it. If, if things like that aren't working, then it's really challenging to get things done. And as we've been talking about Alzheimer's and the fact that our metabolic system doesn't work properly, then it's really impossible for the body to do what it needs to do most efficiently. And one of the things that I've been, that we reviewed when we were doing our Alzheimer's meeting two or three weeks ago was the fact that perhaps we as physicians in our care of patients really may be doing in some instances more harm than good and that's really what we have promised that we will first of all do no harm and it's not because we knowingly are doing this sort of thing but it appears that there are some issues with many of the pharmaceuticals and side effects from these pharmaceuticals that have perhaps collateral damage that may over the long haul be a problem. For instance, we are seeing in people who are statin users this perhaps increased risk for insulin resistance and we know that insulin resistance over time can increase our risk for long-term chronic illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease. We know that as we age, we see significantly more insulin resistance. This is not typically a disease of young people. And what we're seeing is that really a lot of these things begin to happen early on even in our 30s we start to see some of the changes that are beginning to occur and we know that these changes are happening and there is underlying damage that is occurring that are issues that can set us up for these long-term problems and for these neuro, neurodegenerative type illnesses. It's not something that we just wake up with one morning. You're fine one morning and the next morning, all of a sudden you have Alzheimer's disease. So what are the things that we could be doing that could be causing a lot of this collateral damage? And what are the things that we can do to help offset that and, and that's really what we've been talking about so much over the last several weeks is this understanding that the foundational aspects of most of the chronic diseases that we see in the world today really have to do with the fact that our body is taking in more fuel than we need and the type of fuel because we are using much more in the way of things like processed foods and we are not moving as much, we are in front of screens a lot more, we tend to have a reduced social aspect, less community perhaps, especially given the last two or three years. And so we are setting ourselves up for a lot of issues. We know that statins in particular, if you are not looking for insulin resistance, then this is something that can definitely occur. When you cut off a leg of a meta metabolic pathway in the liver for managing glucose, that glucose, unless you change how much is coming in, has got to go somewhere. 
and it tends to raise blood sugar, it tends to raise triglycerides, which then inhibits a lot of the peripheral aspects of being able to manage these, this amount of fuel coming in and makes us much more insulin resistant. We tend to gain more fat in the middle, that visceral fat, which really is hormonally active and the things that can help it. We know that hormonal therapy is beneficial. We know that estrogen for women is beneficial. We know that testosterone for men is beneficial. We know that optimizing thyroid is beneficial for all of these things. And yet we, there is so much pushback and it's fascinating to me. It's not, it's likely that there's not a week that goes by that I don't get a letter from a pharmaceutical company for a patient with insulin resistance and wondering why I don't put them on a statin, which likely is going to make things worse. And so it's really interesting that we are possibly uh, adding to this. Now, yes, <clears throat> we know that statins have been shown to reduce events, but it's fascinating. It's only a two to three percent absolute reduction. So does that mean that 97, 98 percent, we don't see a reduction? Absolutely. We are treating a hundred people and we perhaps reduce the number of events by one to two, three percent. That's not a great drug uh, overall. And yet there are very few people over 50, 60 years of age that have not been at least advised or are not on a statin. And yet we're not really looking at their metabolic issues. And in fact, we're, we're adding statins to our type two diabetics and trying to make an impact there. So I think, you know, the bottom line is what we've talked about so much over the last two or three years, which is lower insulin resistance, increase insulin sensitivity, lower glucose intake, optimize hormones, and get moving more, and finding community and lowering stress. Stress is a huge issue. We know that stress in, in its easiest form of looking at it will raise cortisol, but when we raise cortisol, there are other hormones that go with that called counter-regulatory hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, or adrenaline. And then another hormone called glucagon, which raises blood sugar and makes us much more insulin resistant. So these are things that we've talked about kind of ad nauseum. And I hope that that gives you, again, more impetus to look at lifestyle look at the things that we're doing on a regular basis. And just like I listened to a gal, Amanda Nybert, and she says, it's not about perfection. It's about, it's about progress. And so we want to improve things over time. You know, even 80, 20% try to look at your nutritional program, try to optimize your nutrient density, vegetables, and lowering sugary fruits, optimizing protein sources, getting as, as good a protein source as you can afford, and optimizing good healthy fats, and lowering all of those processed foods, those fast foods, trying to minimize driving through Chick-fil-A, Whataburger, now, it's not that you can't ever do that. It's just that it's not something that needs to be done on a more frequent basis. And certainly through COVID, we know that folks have been drinking a lot more alcohol. And uh, this is a, the fall is a season with lots of football games, lots of parties, and just being wise. One of the things that you can do is lowering alcohol by having either a mineral water or just a glass of water between drinks and I think that you can find you'll be able to significantly reduce your intake there as well. One of the things that we do of course on our labs 
in our office is to evaluate for insulin resistance and try to have some parameter and understanding of when things get a little out of hand and then follow that to see if we can help lower that. Well, I hope that this has been a little bit of some insight for you, understanding that on the one hand, there are things that are beneficial with many of the things that we do, but there are always side effects and we need to look at that. We need to be proactive in looking for insulin resistance and addressing it. Hopefully you all are able to help understand that and we'll continue to look at that. I hope next week we can begin to move into looking at peptides and some of the bioregulators that I've learned about recently. So I'm looking forward to sharing that information with you. You all have a great week and we'll talk again next week.